Right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, today's episode of CAFC Presents. Uh, my name is Doug Maynard, and I'm the Associate Director at CAFC. And uh, it's my uh, pleasure to welcome everyone back to uh, our webinar series, which has been on a bit of a hiatus. We've been a bit sporadic since the summer. We had our annual conference in Toronto a couple weeks ago, et cetera, et cetera. So it's great to be back in, in full swing with our webinars. Um, today's webinar is titled Pain in Children with Developmental Disabilities, What to Do When Everything Else Fails. And we've got some great presenters ready to bring some new and interesting information to you. But uh, before we get to that, I want to make sure that everyone is familiar with our webinar process, as most of you, I'm sure, are. Uh, our webinars are typically 90 minutes long. We do record the entire webinar, and occasionally, if we have a particularly lively discussion, we may go beyond that hour and a half. We do try and stay on as long as our presenters are able to stay. They do have lives back in their real job, so they may have to leave at some point. But uh, we do try and answer all the questions, if at all possible. If you do have to leave at any time during the presentation, by all means do. It doesn't interrupt the, the, the session for you to log off and log back in if you do have to go and do something. And as I mentioned, we do record these, and you can always go back and see the recordings on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network, which is at uh, www.ken.cafc.org. Um, we do uh, share, as I said, we do record the videos and we do post them up on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Uh, this particular session will be on the page that's uh, about to appear on the screen in front of you. We also post anything else that our presenters share with us, like PowerPoint slides or any other resources or links or documents that are shared with us. We will also share with you through the page that you'll see up on the screen. It usually takes me a couple days to get everything up on, the up on this page, um, but uh, you will receive an automated email from the system that lets you know uh, uh, when that's available and, and the specific link to go to find the information. Uh, so without, uh, with that uh, all out of the way, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, our two presenters today. Uh, we have with us Dr. Frank Simons, who is the coordinator of the special education program and a professor in the Department of Educational Psychology at the University of Minnesota. His work is focused in part on issues related to the reliable and valid assessment of pain among individuals with severe developmental disabilities and associated intellectual communication and motor impairments and the relation between pain and self-injury among individuals with developmental disabilities. And we also have with us Dr. Tim Oberlander, uh, who is a physician scientist whose work bridges developmental neurosciences and community child health. As a clinician, he manages pain in children with developmental disabilities at BC Children's Hospital in Vancouver. And as a researcher at the Child and Family Research Institute uh, at the University of British Columbia, his work studies how early life experiences shape stress, pain, and related neurobehavioral outcomes during childhood. So it's my pleasure to uh, to welcome them. And before I hand the, the podium over, I just wanted to comment that uh, this there's been a, a massive response to this topic, and I think we have it's. Uh, I was just comment telling our presenters that it's our second biggest webinar ever. We have a, an, an international audience from around the world. We have more than 250 organizations signed on, and, and I think that's that's a testament to the the importance. I think uh, many across the child and youth health community are struggling with this issue with with pain in general. Our, our work with the CIHR team in children's pain has been has been very uh, has, has generated a lot a lot of interest. But I think this uh, topic of pain in children with developmental disabilities has been uh, has obviously been of particular interest. So it is my uh, my absolute pleasure to hand the uh, virtual podium over uh, first to Dr. Tim Oberlander. Uh, over to you, Dr. Oberlander. Great, thank you very much for that introduction. Let me make sure that I'm uh, uh, on the right screen. The first poll question. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, bear with me while I go through this uh, technological vortex here because I'm. Um, I would love to see the audience, but I can't, and uh, you're going to have to bear with me while I'm uh, engaging with my computer. Uh, I can hear you laughing in the background, uh, in the virtual background. Uh, I'm really thrilled uh, to be uh, presenting on this topic with Frank, and thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, not because we are going to provide you with a recipe or answers to success to manage pain assessing children with neurologic and mental disabilities, but uh, an approach that um, concepts and focuses on uh, what are the tools that are needed to uh, get out of a difficult spot, and that's what led me to uh, pitch the question what to do when yeah, all else fails. Hopefully by the end of this uh, 
session, we'll have uh, uh, more tools in our toolbox. We were, um, at the outset, uh, Frank and I wanted to uh, pitch uh, some questions to you and get your feedback as a way of um, developing a conversation about what you think is important and what you think uh, might be the critical um, uh, factors that uh, prevent uh, successful uh, pain assessment and management in this uh, uh, pediatric or child health population. Frank and I started uh, thinking about uh, pain in children with uh, developmental disabilities about 15 years ago, and uh, our conversation has uh, spanned sides of the border, uh, telephone and other correspondence, and, um, and uh, we're puzzling over what it is that uh, we know it, that we, we don't know. And uh, for the most part, we, we believe that uh, significant progress has been made in this field, and uh, we really uh, have seen a, a full progress both in uh, the clinical and research level over the last uh, 15 years. However, there are many questions that remain, uh, primarily related to um, uh, understanding the neurobiology of the pain system, the presence of the disability, uh, how, does, how do genetic and metabolic factors alter uh, perception and expression of pain, and then uh, importantly, uh, what are our tools that we have, both pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic, that might help us um, both uh, improve the uh, short-term and long-term uh, outcomes, because what we're very clear about is that uh, pain still remains a significant part of children's lives and, and families' lives with, uh, with disabilities. To start the, uh, the morning off, we, uh, we'd like to have your answers to uh, the following five questions, and I'm going to have Doug uh, lead us through how we're going to answer those questions, and uh, Doug, just tell me when I should change the slide. Yeah. Okay, so if you could lead us through uh, how to answer the questions, uh, where to post the responses, and um, and then how we're going to tabulate them. Sure. So as uh, yeah, absolutely. As uh, Dr. Oberlander said, we're going to go through a series of questions here, and we're going to and many of you have seen have been through the polling uh, process uh, with our webinars before. We're going to ask you a number of questions. Some of them are poll questions, and some of them are open ended questions. And in order to respond to the open ended questions, we're just going to get you to type the answers into your question box. And we're going to come back to the answers later on in the presentation. So, uh, so the first question that we're asking um, is, what is the impact of daily pain in children with developmental disabilities? And, and you just need to go up and click on the screen and choose uh, how, how big you think the impact of daily pain is on children with disabilities. Is, it, is the impact mild, moderate, or extreme on a scale of one to five there? So this is an open-ended question. Um, so just type your answer into the into the question box. So what are, in your opinion, the, the sources of everyday pain in children with developmental disabilities? All right. And while people are still typing in some of those answers, we can even, maybe even move on to the third question, which is another poll question. So feel free to continue typing in your responses there while we move on. The third question is, Again, a poll, so just click on the screen with your answer. And the question is, how effective are you in assessing pain in children with developmental disabilities? Again, on a scale of one to five, where one is not effective at all and five is very effective. Close that one off and we can move on to the fourth question. So the next question, again, is an open-ended question. And they're asking, what are the barriers you face in managing chronic pain in children with developmental disabilities? Yeah. yeah, no, you, we can go on to the fifth question here. I think uh, the answers are starting to tail off a bit. So the, the fifth question is, why does treatment fail even when you have done everything, and in quotes, uh, quote unquote, right? When you've done everything right, why does tr treatment fail e even then? All right, so as people are uh, continuing to put in answers for that one, you know, feel, free, feel free to continue uh, answering. Uh, we'll hand the, the podium back over to you, Dr. Oberlander. The two critical... Uh areas that we want to talk about this morning, one, are, one is what do we know about the uh, neurobiology of uh, the nociceptive system? And for that, uh, Frank Simons uh, will lead off. And then I will come back to, uh, uh, using your answers, uh, try to frame a uh, response to um, how to get ourselves unstuck or what to think about uh, to get ourselves unstuck when we're faced with uh, pain resistant and uh, difficult to manage uh, pain. 
Okay, thanks, Tim. I appreciate it. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. I'm Frank Simons, and I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this conversation. Always uh, learn something when I spend time with Tim. Just a couple of context questions. Um, I'm in special ed. Uh, and so the idea that I'm leading off the discussion about the neurobiology of pain, that's a bit of a, of a gap. But I thought what I would do in, and be mindful of time is, are three things. One, just review scope of the problem. And I've looked at the attendee list or the registration list. And for many of my remarks, I'm quite certain I'm preaching to the choir. And I'm quite certain many of you know more than I uh, of what I speak, but I'll just I'll just go through for brevity's sake a number of slides reviewing scope of the problem. I've got a short section regarding biomarkers, and then I thought I would try to put it together with a current project specific to girls with Rett syndrome, in which we are uh, developing a pain research initiative. When I finish that, we'll uh, go back and review answers to questions, and then that will segue into Tim's presentation. He's he's the real doctor, I'm the academic, and so he's going to provide the solutions to some of the problems our group studies. So for starters, this is a picture of the Millcroft Inn. I have that up for two reasons. One, it's green, and it's not green right now in Minnesota, so I like to see green. And two, it was the site of a, a pain conference specific to developmental disabilities supported in part by May Day in January of 2000. And Tim and I put this slide together when we presented to the Board of Directors for May Day, uh, the, the, the September of the year prior. And a little timeline of some of the work that's been done, and I know some of the attendees online have contributed to this work, and certainly not exhaustive, but from the point of departure of Millcroft, and again, a group of folks getting around uh, exclusively to talk about issues specific to the problem of pain and developmental disability, and I'm using that term quite broadly, children and adults, a number of things have happened since then. Certainly the work on from the East Coast of Canada with Lynn Bro and Pat McGraw's group, uh, the development of the NICPIC, uh, the Non-Communicating Children's Pain Checklist, and Hunt on the other side of the, the pond, the Pediatric Pain Profile. There's certainly work in Michigan with Terry Volpa Lewis repurposing the FLAC. Uh, I had the opportunity to work with Tim and Bundle, part of what came out of the Millcroft, and we created that edited volume on pain locally through Gillette Children's Specialty Healthcare here in St. Paul, Minnesota. We put together uh, two conferences specific to pain uh, and developmental disability across the lifespan. And so one of our issues though is where are we going and uh, where should we be going? So what I thought the goal for me is a quick review of progress and I've been characterizing it to folks that know me as building a better mouse trap. And I would, I would say the past decade we, we, we've tried to do that. Groups have quasi-independently created scales or versions like that, rating scales, checklists, etc., cetera, um, to get at this, this, this construct of pain. And I think there's still a need for consciousness raising in terms of the broader community, uh, whether that's clinical practice or research about the problem of pain in, in this setting, in this population. One of the questions then is, have we caught more mice? So is, is the pain better being better assessed or measured uh, is it being better managed? And there's a knowledge translation implementation set of issues there that really haven't been addressed yet, although I know some folks at Toronto are, are starting that. Um, and then news from the bench, you know, not all pain is the same. We know there are physiologically different mechanisms, and so there's knowledge transfer issues there as well. And one, one of the foci that Tim and I have begun really um, discussing and, and thinking through are, are the promises that w and whether biomarkers um, and the, the, the validity and clinical utility of biomarkers, whether there's any promises there. So uh, this is a slide some of you may have seen before. I, I've done this before where, you know, I take PubMed and type in pediatric uh, pain, uh, uh, pain and plus, that's plus developmental disability, and pain, human, right? And, you know, there's an enormous amount published uh, in five-year epics on pain and human. And, and then when you drop down to pediatric pain, not developmental disability, just pediatric pain, that's the blue line, it, it drops precipitously. And that little red line is, is partly our world, pain and, and developmental disability. Now, there's nothing scientific. You blow this up and say, okay, there's pediatric pain, and, and you see the elbows there. That, that's, that's not surprising. That ties in with the work of Sonny Anand and others 
where the argument was being made as recently as, as the 80s, if we've forgotten about, you know, quote unquote, typically developing newborns and human infants probably experience pain. That was at issue, uh, just to remind you. Um, and so where, where are we? We're, we're over here. We're, we're not far off that horizontal axis yet. There, there is more work to be done. And so when you blow up, what is the work that's being done? It's primarily, as I mentioned, been an assessment and much less in management. So, so there's that first knowledge translation issue of how do we, even within our own small community of investigators and clinical providers, bridge this, this practice gap. So what's the scope of the problem? Again, I'm preaching to the choir, I realize that. So I'm gonna be brief in, in, these, in this section. But we know just sort of quasi-epidemiological point prevalence estimates over the years that this is a, a, a significant problem just by numbers, descriptively, among non-communicating children with a range of severity of developmental disability delay and intellectual, associated intellectual, communicative, and motor impairments. The, the, the most and prototypic population study are certainly children and adults with cerebral palsy. Um, a lot of the work out of the Joyce Engel and that group, uh, and along with uh, Maureen O'Donnell and, and, and Kim and that group, have clearly documented um, prevalence of pain in that group, and you know, and that continues. And so, here's the most recent example uh, in pediatrics out of our, our friends in in, in uh, Canada again. Of this is a problem, and I, I would characterize, you know, in addition to prevalence sampling, in, increasingly what people are doing, and this is a fine example. This paper is documenting impact uh, on activities of daily living and looking at corroboration across proxy reporters, in this case, physicians, parents. And they also had uh, the, the children who were capable of self-reporting, self-report. So that's, that's, we know that the problem is, is there and it's prevalent amongst a range of developmental disabilities. We know there are a variety of sources of pain uh, associated with everyday pain, activities of daily living, hips, skin, contractures, feeding, assistance devices. There's a procedural pain uh, many of the individuals you serve or, or provide supports to, um, by virtue of their handicapping conditions, are exposed to a number of procedures um, of which there's pain associated with that. Um, often there are surgeries. We work, uh, I don't work to, directly through my colleagues at Gillette Children, right? There's a lot of surgeries that go on to correct uh, conditions associated with CP or, or other developmental disabilities. And so there's surgical pain. And then perhaps most, you know, difficult is acute on chronic. And so the example there would be a child living with chronic spasticity or dystonia and CP, that there's some degree of chronicity to the pain that rides along with that, and then there can be acute on top of that. So there are multiple sources of pain. And we know that it's significant in terms of what a, a snapshot looks like in terms of day in, day out, or week in and week out. And this is work by Lynn Bro and colleagues documenting in a short term prospective uh, repeated measures approach uh, looking weekly and when you look at these estimates of hours uh, by week in pain this is certainly exceeding what you would typically see in a quote unquote typical sample pediatric sample this is a group of children with severe uh, developmental disabilities associated with intellectual impairments so we, we know there's uh, the, the problem is prevalent um, there's a, a variety of sources and the impact related to um, time spent is, is significant. The point of the next three slides is just to make us a, a snapshot of the landscape in terms of the types of pain that we study. We're thinking about etiology, both the pain, but also the, the handicapping condition or impairment, the mechanisms that we know that might be relevant, the nature of the impairments, the assessment and management approaches. And really, just what I've highlighted, you know, we've spent time thinking about symptom management, symptom assessment, communicative impairments, acute and procedural pain. We've started to dabble a little bit in motor impairments and signs and chronic. And this is my soapbox. What I would argue is despite the work that the groups that, that I've mentioned have done, I think we're still dealing with some bias and beliefs in the system. Um, and, you know, there's my low-tech, uh, you know, PowerPoint magic there. I think that's overshadowing 
a lot of what yet needs to be done and could be done in terms of better understanding what Tim alluded to right at the outset of the underlying neurobiology. I don't think we're investigating um, as much as we could because I think there's still uh, a set of beliefs and biases out there that's slowing us down. And so let me just segue, that's my segue into thinking about, you know, not all pain is the same, right? And so Descartes got it partly right, but we know that we have, there's physiological mechanisms and therefore physiological pain. And this is what we're, most people, certainly in the general public, when we're talking about pain, are thinking about, right? Um, there's an, an acute nociceptive stimulus and pain is transduced and transducted, etc. But we know there's inflammatory pain that, that, that is distinct from um, nociceptive pain and there's also neuropathic pain. And these involve different mechanisms um, and they're going to respond differently to management approaches. And they're also going to make things very messy in terms of trying to understand in a, in a vulnerable population in which access to the subjective experience is difficult. And so Tim and I talked about this sort of, many of you are familiar in, in a general sense in, uh, in with what's called the valley of death. And if you're not, don't worry. Um, we're just talking about the gap between bench and bedside. And in industry and the public-private sectors, there's this notion of valley of death, of things get started and well-funded there. And if you can get through this valley of the in-between, you can get into translation. So what does that look like in, in our world? And we've, we're optimists, and it's a valley of discovery. There's a lot of ideas, and there are a lot of people and collaborators in it. The testament is the, the sheer numbers that have signed up for this morning's uh, meeting. Um, there's no shortage, unfortunately, of clinical populations. The technology developments in the last decade, we are in a sensor technology decade, um, are tremendous. Um, so, you know, where what's to be discovered? Well, we're still refining the behavioral phenotypes, both in terms of the condition of intellectual and developmental disability, but also pain phenotypes. This is where we're wondering whether and what the value and the contribution that can be made but through thinking about biomarkers. Uh, Tim is going to directly square on, talk about therapeutic failures. There are issues related to um, maybe reframing of, of a generic developmental disability, but into the international classification to help us think about where the entry points are um, in relation to interventions. And then education, more, very broadly, in terms of knowledge transfer. So. So if you think across the lifespan and neurodevelopmental of the neurodegenerative, we certainly have no shortage of animal models. And that's where we're just thinking about positioning ourselves in part, including biomarkers as part of the agenda and how that could inform rational pharmacotherapy. So one question then, if we start talking about biomarkers is, you know, do objective measures of pain exist? And um, this is just a gloss over, certainly from an NIH perspective, there have been many and these are getting dated now, but just from a quick history, uh, again from the start of the decade, prior decade, there's there have been many NIH working papers and uh, PAs and RFPs called for, for applications and proposals that relate to chasing after biomarkers, right, um, for all sorts of diseases and disorders. And just quickly, if, you know, what is a, what's a biological marker? This is the generic uh, definition. I'm not going to read it out, um, but that's what we're talking about. And so you can see that it's, it's tricky to think about, but it might be relevant for the issues and problems we're facing in terms of access. And why would we want to do this? Well, this could, this could lead to potentially new targets. Um, it helps with that, that research to bench, um, or research bench to practice gap in terms of, you know, are the animal models even relevant for the issues that we're seeing in developmental disability disorder? What about in terms of studies? particularly multi-site studies, this might help with patient stratification in ways that we haven't been able to do um, before. It could get at thinking about pathology to the degree to which that's disease, but pathology in some of these neurobiological substrates um, and, you know, teasing apart individual differences, right? Not everybody, um, not every shoe is the same size. We try to often come at it one size fits all. And so there are going to be individual differences in response to treatment, taking a biomarker or adding, adding in a complementary way a biomarker approach might be useful to tease apart who's responding and in what way uh, and move us forward from there. So 
uh, this is a quick example, and I'm, I'm not going to get into details, but this is an example from our group where, you know, what does this look like? Well, we've been dabbling with collecting specimens, saliva, blood, CSF, when, when and where we can. And this is an example of taking saliva um, and working with a uh, spectroscopy group and seeing that, you know, keeping them blind to the context of the patient population um, using a partial least squares approach, you can we found separations in a collection of cytokines and chemokines, so so molecules that are important for inflammation, uh, immune immune derived infl inflammatory markers. The green is the pain group, and the red is the non pain group. Now these are very small numbers. This is pilot work. I will say this is not published data. We presented it once at the International Forum of Pediatric Pain, but I just wanted to, to draw your attention. If I'm going to mention biomarkers. Here's an example of what um, our group is talking about. There are certainly other avenues. You know, we're quote unquote quite wet. We've been doing specimens, uh, certainly with the imaging capacity groups have right now. Brain is where pain is in part, and there are developments there as well. So what I wanted to do is just take the last five or ten minutes of my time and walk through kind of one approach of how we're trying to put it together. And, and it's revolving right now in part around uh, Rett syndrome. And for those of you who are not familiar with Rett syndrome, it's a developmental disability primarily affecting girls and women. Um, it's a low incidence, so it would be considered, in, at least in NIH speak, a, a rare disease, um, about 1 in 15,000. There happens to be a very active Rett syndrome parent association in Minnesota that's now become Midwest and a Rett clinic at Gillette Children's. And so we, my group and my students and postdocs have been very involved in initiating a, a, a number of clinically oriented research projects, one of which includes pain. Uh, these girls are very uh, multi, multiply handicapped. Uh, this is a, a, a syndrome that affects a, a gene called MECP2, and it produces a protein and a loss of function. And in the absence of that protein or reduced levels of that protein, there are a number of features to the behavioral phenotype. These girls appear to develop typically, um, and then there's a sharp regression around 18 to 24 months that are picked up by an astute pediatrician, um, head, 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 head circumference, et cetera, growth indicators start to drop off. And for our purposes, these girls are primarily, not exclusively, primarily nonverbal. There are a number of handicapping conditions. They, they, the majority become non-ambulatory. Seizures become quite pronounced and difficult to manage. Scoliosis emerges, and there are pronounced motor stere stereotypies as well as self-injury and autonomic regulatory issues. And so there are issues for us that this is a vulnerable group, obviously, and we wonder about issues in pain. And so relatively recently, the American Journal of Medical Genetics, just to give you an example of things that catch my eye is a paper linking that protein in that gene to pain sensitivity and, you know, explicitly Rett syndrome. I don't need to read all this, just to draw your attention, a claim made, decreased sensitivity to pain in the majority of the population. Now, there is this lore or perspective on parents and providers that girls with Rett, quote unquote, don't feel pain. And I'm making some of these statements, not facetiously, but quite deliberately on the extreme just to make points. Um, but there very much is this sense that these girls don't feel pain and here's here's a here's a study more or less corroborating that for the majority. Now how how is pain sensitivity addressed? And so this is large uh, these again I mentioned low incidence but large databases through online questionnaires through a variety of international consortium based wrecked websites where they're asking an open-ended or semi-structured questionnaires to parents about whether or not they think their daughter um, uh, has any abnormal displays of pain sensitivity. That's perfectly reasonable. But the inference then becomes, based on, on, on those reports, those proxy reports, through questionnaire about pain sensitivity, is there's decreased sensitivity. And the inference is then, therefore, that thresholds are elevated and, quote, unquote, girls, people with RET don't feel pain. And so, so, so we know, we know from, from some of you, I'm sure, on, on this webinar, um, and I know mostly from hanging around with Ken Craig, but others as well, experience and expression are not synonyms. And they don't necessarily travel 
in the same direction. And so the degree to which expression is altered, blunted, different, it doesn't logically or necessarily follow that the experience is any different. And I know we know this, but it's worth pointing out because that's what's going on as part of the problem from, from where I sit. So we, we thought, well, let's look at this. And so that we surveyed that parent group here locally within the state, um, just an initial survey of, uh, and these, these samples are all small and all clinical, of 44 girls and women um, and their families. Um, locally, and uh, used items from the non-communicating children pain checklist that I modified, uh, nothing substantial, just to get into our survey packet. And what we found is, you know, certainly when you ask it this way, using uh, quote unquote a validated pain scale, um, as opposed to maybe open-ended, you, you certainly see a range of response, right, in terms of parents reporting. Um, that some of their girls or daughters are experiencing pain in the past, this is past month, uh, there's also a great deal of uncertainty. In terms of sources, these are some of our, uh, what you might expect, GI, um, uh, everyday pain associated with procedures going through different therapies, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a range of sources. Um, there's a range of report about no, we don't think so, to yes, to we're not certain. Um, 24, so just to summarize, 24% of it are reporting um, uh, pain in, of eight or more days greater than one week in duration. The major, uh, almost half unsure. Um, the majority, 90%, did not have were nonverbal. Did not have words to communicate pain. Uh, the most frequent form for communicating pain would be the face carries a great deal of weight, and then vocalization. I mentioned GI was the most commonly reported, et cetera, et cetera. I don't need to read through this. But just to say, so in contrast to the open-ended questionnaire of reports of, yeah, altered, they, there seems to be altered sensitivity or differences when you ask, well, how do you think about your daughter's pain? And if we give you these anchors, meaning the non-communicating children pain checklist, do you see behaviors that look like this? And certainly many of the parents do. So, so, how do we go at this then? And Rhett and Pain is 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 a good organizer for. We have a goal, right? Uh, improve comfort and reduce pain. What does pain look like in Rhett? And you can substitute any developmental disability. And and what are the pain drivers in Rhett? So how would we go about this? I've mentioned before. It's a problem of access. It's a subjective state. Uh, it's a complex construct, and it's pain and nociception aren't synonyms. So what do we do? So what we're doing is, you know, we're going after, to use that kind of language, pain symptoms, nonverbal. We're thinking about signs. We have adapted some of the nonverbal checklists into a standardized pain examination procedure we call PEP um, with a checklist that we score based on any responses during that pain examination procedure. And it's simply a passive range of motion that we do in the same way across any patients or participants in the research projects. We are thinking about sensory features, and we're not going to talk too much about this today, but we've been modifying quantitative sensory testing-like approaches to get at that element of, of nociceptive pathways and the pain construct, and thinking about biomarkers and so of others. There are issues with substance P, and there's been work done in the cerebral spinal fluid looking at substance P in red. Um, and there's been post-mortem studies looking at nerve growth factor that may be relevant to thinking about the neurobiology of RET. And I will mention we've been thinking about, and I mentioned part of the phenotype of RET is autonomic um, regulatory issues. And uh, we've been looking at some, because there have been remarkable advances in infrared, and I know there's a history that's sketchy, but we've been looking at infrared thermal cameras, part, partly because part of the phenotype of RET are cold hands, cold feet. That's diagnostic. And so we were interested in that already, of uh, quantifying that in a little more detail. And we're trying to see, well, can we put those two together, meaning what we can learn from infrared and cold hands, cold feet, autonomic, and does that relate at all to what we see for pain? So this is this is pilot pilot work. Um, we've been growing a cohort of girls with, and women with, with RET, where we've been now sort of moving from that survey, right, to a pain examination procedure paired with our pain and discomfort scale. 
And so that gives us our quote unquote objective um, signs. We also have our parent questionnaires, brief pain inventory, so looking at impact. I call it the Dalhousie pain interview. It comes out of our Dalhousie friends, and it's a detailed set of questions to get at pain frequency, duration, etc. Usually we do this in a one week recall. And then uh, our friend and Nick Pick are. Um, so we get that scale in there as well. And in, that, in this emerging sample, we're seeing you know, a majority, the overall overwhelming majority of participants are being reported on as experiencing pain in the prior week, um, significantly so in terms of pain interference with activities of daily living. And again, this idea that face seems to carry the load. And just a couple of slides, these are descriptive only, on face being the primary um, modality for quote-unquote communication that parents are reporting, so if you will, subjective or symptoms, and then also in our pain exam uh, that we then score with raters trained to a certain criterion and reliable, where face is where we see the observable pain behaviors mostly occurring. So that's the work we're doing right now. And the takeaway points are simply that pain appears to be a problem in girls with RET. And I would just contrast that with the possible takeaway a reader might have from that pain report I mentioned earlier, where the inference is, hey, the majority of, of girls and women living with RET are insensitive to pain. Well, when you ask about pain in different ways and you assess in different ways, it seems to be a problem. Um, we see this with, with both subjective, objective approaches. And so from a clinical care perspective, it seems like it ought to alert us as a suspicion of index when you, when you see a population in which they're nonverbal, developmental disability, a host of comorbid uh, health and um, other impairment features that, that we're going to need to, to, you know, back to the bias and beliefs, be thinking about, well, how do they express as opposed to they don't experience. Um, and now that was part of my soapbox. So I'm going to end with some, some, some pictures based on what I mentioned, the infrared thermography and related to autonomic regulatory issues. And so these girls, again, it's not, a, it's not new. They have cold hands, cold feet. And what we're trying to do, though, is quantify that and see if we can move with that, both in terms of autonomic issues, but now also pain. And so that's an example of some, some very uh, big differences. And for those of you who are symmetry buffs and skin temperature, you know, in all of us, if we take the, 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 the two sides that are matching, the, uh, 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 one site that's contralateral match on surface temperature, we should typically be within a, a degree, a, a centigrade difference. And when you get a larger than a degree centigrade, some people, at least clinical people who think about brain and, and autonomic, start worrying and wondering um, what's up. Um, so, so what we take those clinical images, uh, we're able to quantify, this is in Fahrenheit, I apologize, uh, but we do convert to centigrade. We, we quant we're starting to quantify the uh, for the individual differences, the degree of asymmetry, and you know now we're at so what, and there's two parts to the so what. There's a group of engineering types actually in Toronto where you know there's there's a thought that you could classify affective states thinking about thermal imaging and, and stuff like that, and that may be the case. A little bit lower level for me, what we've done is taken our PADS scores, PADS total score characterized individuals, these are three individuals, and that's their total PAD score, and then looked at it in relation to um, symmetry, asymmetry. And for what it's worth for these three individuals, um, and I'm borrowing from Lynn Bro and colleagues' cut score on the Nick pick, which is a seven, um, and we can talk about cut scores if we want. Don't put a lot of stock in this, but I, I wanted just to make it as an illustration of one, one approach to putting things together. You know, the girls for whom there were massive asymmetries were also the girls for whom had higher PADS total scores than this individual without, she, she had no asymmetry between left and right for feet or hands and the lower pain score. Now I will tell you, um, we've been replicating, meaning as we add, we continue to see pretty big asymmetries, we continue to see lots of pain reported um, and through scoring, we don't always see this relation between the temperature asymmetries and whether or not uh, for any one individual girl there seems to be problems with pain. So that story 
is not solid, but I wanted to show it to you as a way we're trying to organize the knowledge we're generating and collecting. And so I think with that, uh, just this is my transition slide that I think we think, and by we I mean Tim's group and our group here at Minnesota and Gillette Children's, that there seems to be, it's you know, warranted for further work investigating, thinking about rel nociceptive relevant biomarkers to improving understanding of that underlying neural substrate and how that may or may not set limits on what's going on in terms of what we see in terms of clinical phenotypes to move us toward possible new targets. So thank you for, for your time and attention. What we're going to do now, I think, is turn it back to see what kinds of uh, answers we got to those questions. Um, and then it's gonna, I'm going to turn it over to Tim to walk through the useful knowledge of what to do. So thank you very much. All right, and thank you, Frank. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, so as uh, Frank mentioned, we're going to go back to the answers to the questions that you uh, provided answers to. So the first question was, uh, what is the impact of daily pain in children with developmental disabilities? And uh, uh, it was 34% uh, uh, said the impact is extreme, gave it a 5 on a scale of 1 to 5. 45% uh, said uh, gave it a 4 out of 5. 19% uh, gave it a 3 out of 5. So the vast majority gave it a 4 out of 5, more than uh, almost, I guess that's 79%, uh, gave it a 4 or 5 out of 5 as far as the impact. So the second question was, what are the sources of everyday pain? And and by the way, we had uh, a few hundred responses to these open-ended questions, so we certainly won't go through them all, but there certainly seem to be, the most common seem to be a general class of musculoskeletal, everything from spasticity and stiffness in ankles, uh, hips and knees, uh, dislocation of hips and knees, um, contractures, that sort of thing. I, was, I would say, just eyeballing it here, was by far the most common type of responses. Uh, I would say the second most common would be GI pain and, and a lot of uh, it, it, people just generally commenting on GI pain and, and some specifying uh, constipation in, uh, in particular. Uh, there were a number of uh, comments around sort of the daily activities were the cause of the pain. So uh, people mentioning uh, having a, a bath or getting dressed or that sort of thing, sort of just general activity was the, the source of their pain. Um, and then I would say after uh, there was actually quite a uh, quite a few mentioning teeth and dental pain uh, as well. Uh, so that uh, probably sums up the vast majority of those. Um, the third question was was how effective are you in assessing pain? And uh, the vast uh, about fifty percent said uh, gave themselves a three out of five as far as their effectiveness. The next most common answer was twenty nine percent, which was which was only a two out of five. So there were very few people, only 11% total gave themselves a 4 or a 5 out of 5 uh, as describing their own effectiveness in assessing pain in children with disabilities. Um, the fourth question was around what are the barriers to, uh, the, what are the barriers that you face in managing chronic pain in children with developmental disabilities? And by far it was uh, uh, the communication issues, uh, inability to, for the for the child to communicate exactly what their problem is or what their pain is or in the, even the fact that they have pain uh, or the, uh, the uh, many talked about the uh, practitioner's ability to communicate what solutions might be uh, for, for their pain. So the communication on both, in both directions was, was by far the, uh, the most common answer. There was a lot of things about uh, fear, fear of uh, getting needles, fear of, of taking opioids, fear of practitioners giving opioids was another one that was uh, listed uh, quite often. For some, it was uh, about uh, navigating the system. So knowing when the child is experiencing chronic pain, who to go to, having access to service providers that can actually deal with it, whether it be specialists or clinics and that sort of thing. Yeah, again, uh, more comments about getting a diagnosis and that sort of thing. Um, efficient service, sharing, sharing of results between different uh, uh, institutions so, or service providers. Uh, so a, lack of, again, a, a lot of comments about the complexity of, uh, of these children in general in their disorders. And I think that sort of ties in with the uh, sharing of results between different providers. They're often dealing with different providers and there's no sharing of results and, and coordinated strategies to approach this in a holistic way. But yeah, definitely communication was, uh, was definitely the biggest uh, issue there. Or uh, was the uh, sorry the bar biggest barrier? Uh, and if we go on to question five, uh, why does it fail when we've done everything uh, in in uh, again in quotes when we've done everything right? 
Um, the biggest ones there were, uh, again, it was a lot, again, about communication. So uh, treating what you think is pain, but the inability for the child to communicate what actually is the source of pain. So going through a treatment process that's not appropriate for the pain and and the disconnect being because of a difficulty in communicating what the actual source was. Uh, again, a lot of comments about the complexity of the child in, in, uh, in general, um, resulting in the, the failure when everything's been done right. A lot of comments about the fact that these children are, again, complex and that they have multiple sources of the pain. So if you're only treating one, you're, the child is still in pain, even if you're only treating one, of the, one or two of, of what might be multiple sources of pain. And then a lot of comments about um, both in the barriers, uh, which was question four, and in question five about why things fail is lack of knowledge of what to do. So again, going back to the title of this webinar, what do you do when everything else fails? Uh, a lot of people commenting about their own lack of understanding of how to treat pain and what their what their treatments, treatment options are as far as what they can off, offer to the patient. Um, there's definitely a lot of people commenting that they have a lack of understanding of what uh, what might be out there for them. So I think that more or less summarizes uh, uh, the answers. I've handed the control of the screen over to you, Dr. Oberlander. And again, uh, if we can make sure we keep uh, your voice nice and loud and, and straight into that microphone. That's, that's great. Uh, so it's the uh, first slide on the screen. Excellent. Well, that's, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, Doug. And uh, Frank, uh, that's a, a tremendous uh, overview of some really critical uh, new findings, but some uh, pressing questions that um, should help us in uh, navigating this um, this clinical area and this research area as well. I'm impressed that uh, you've already actually already as a group you've already done the work to answer the question what to do uh, when all else fails because you've already provided um, a tremendously rich uh, set of answers uh, to um, this very puzzling and uh, frustrating uh, uh, clinical setting that we often find ourselves in. Uh, so the rest of what I'm going to talk about for the next uh, 30 minutes then is really essentially just commentary, uh, and I'm going to go back to um, the um, uh, to your answers uh, as we go through. Uh, first of all, the following vignette uh, of uh, of a uh, child with a, a somewhat mysterious pain and uh, a development of disability. Um, but I think I'd like to just highlight a, a few points. One of them is that I think we can all it's not difficult to, uh, to imagine that uh, uh, pain um, continues to be a common everyday um, source of uh, uh, suffering and uh, both for uh, children and their families um, and that musculoskeletal and GI uh, sources uh, are, were identified as, uh, as the um, uh, leading uh, sources. But I think we need to understand that uh, while pain um, is a universal uh, uh, human experience. At one level, it's neurobiology uh, can be understood, but at another level, it is um, almost unknowable because of its subjective um, and highly ambiguous presentation. And this is uh, no different than for children with uh, disabilities, uh, just because of uh, motor, social, or communication impairments. Uh, they are no they are no less likely to experience uh, pain than their peers. Uh, in fact, as, as the group has reported, that they're even more likely to experience pain because it's not just a part of the disorder, uh, but that the everyday uh, activities also induce uh, uh, painful events that uh, for other children are, are not painful. Um, as a result, uh, many children with um, developmental disabilities uh, can simply go undiagnosed um, or unrecognized because of the uh, communication, motor, or social barriers that uh, that influence uh, the way in which a pain um, resonates with their caregivers and the, and the world around them. I'm going to come to this uh, question of what to do when we're stuck uh, from my perspective as a clinician uh, and as a developmental pediatrician. Um, and I have to say at the outset that I don't have I have some answers, or I have some thoughts about possible answers, but I'm not sure that uh, we're going to find the answer. Um, and what I'd like to say at the outset is that it is probably a process uh, that we need to get started, uh, and that there is really uh, a set of steps that 
are required rather than um, one or two interventions uh, like a drug or a procedure or um, uh, or some therapeutic intervention that, that can work for all children and works all the time. So uh, uh, I'd like to start by just uh, using a vignette to illustrate some of the issues that we often find ourselves in um, uh, a clinical setting, which are probably very uh, obvious to, to all of you. Uh, this is a story of Joe, who as a 12-year-old with choreoarthritic uh, cerebral palsy, he presented with um, poorly controlled movement disorder, uh, weight loss. Uh, he'd be living in a group home in the community uh, some distance from uh, tertiary care center. Uh, he had increased frequency and intensity of uh, generalized arousal and crying. And the question was, was this irritability of a known or unknown origin, and could it have possibly been pain? He'd undergone multiple uh, investigations um, and procedures, and the uh, working diagnosis um, was that it was that his uh, irritability was probably of a musculoskeletal origin, although nothing had been specifically identified. Uh, but clearly, his symptoms were exacerbated by his movement disorder. He had an underlying seizures disorder as well. There was a family history of schizophrenia, and because of his uh, borderline cognitive ability, uh, a psychiatrist in the community had raised the question of whether he had um, thought or mood disorder that may have under, uh, under was underlying his uh, his irritability, and and uh, that made the conversation even more complex uh, about what was going on. Uh, what was known, though, was that he had dislocated hips. He had bilateral hip and knee pain um, as well. Uh, he was orally fed, uh, but he was also receiving a nutrition via gastrotomy tube. Uh, he experienced a GI reflux, uh, which was also seen as a source of, of episodic pain. Um, his mother was in poor mental health, uh, and because of her concurrent pregnancy, he'd been placed in foster care. Uh, which seemed to also exacerbate his irritability. He was able to communicate with a variety of monosyllabic uh, words, facial expressions, and body movements, but they were specific uh, uh, and somewhat idiosyncratic, um, and that in inexperienced caregiver may have difficulty interpreting his, his gestures and, and uh, nonverbal communication. His medications included uh, baclofen, clonazepam, erythromycin, phenytoin, omeprazole, uh, clopromazine, um, which uh, is still used, uh, rarely, but is still used uh, in the community, uh, paroxetine and salbutamol for reactive airway disease. On an as-needed as -needed basis, he received uh, ibuprofen and acetaminophen with codeine. Um, prior to his admission, uh, he'd been on meparidine, and uh, there'd been no pain relief uh, noted or no change in his irritability. His chronic irritability, of course, had an impact on everyday life, limited his participation in activities of daily living, it reduces appetite. Uh, this, uh, his caregivers felt, uh, was um, uh, um, as, as a consequence, his, his caregivers saw this as a source for his weight loss. He had disrupted sleep, his mood suffered, and uh, he was less mobile. Uh, his pain also increased his rigidity, uh, muscle tone, and uh, his GI reflux. He couldn't find a comfortable position to lie in at, at night. His uh, care team involved a family doctor, a pediatrician, psychiatrist, orthopedic surgeon, community nurses, social workers, and they were spread across multiple regions. Uh, there was no common venue for communication or case coordination between his multiple caregivers. However, there was one common thing which tied them all together, and that was an increasing uh, concern about his pain and its impact on daily life, and they were all very frustrated. So there was not only pain within uh, Joe, but there was pain within his uh, caregiving community. And it was uh, at that level, uh, and it was at that moment, that he was uh, admitted uh, for our care. Well, um, at the outset, I found this uh, to be a somewhat, I mean, an incredibly complex and somewhat confusing uh, picture. And so I decided I would draw a pain map. And I, I think this might be a helpful way to look at what's connected and what's not. And of course, I drew many of these uh, circles uh, with uh, bi-directional arrows, but one may, um, may argue with me that maybe these are actually unidirectional um, arrows, and, um, but it, it is useful to, 
undertake uh, a picture like this, uh, to undertake this exercise to develop both a metaphorical picture and a real picture that can help um, the team uh, figure out what, what to do first and second. But, uh, oh. but as a critical other part to this uh, picture, uh, it was clear that he was on uh, a number of medications that may have also exacerbated some of these items in each of these circles and thereby contributing to his uh, underlying um, irritability that might have been pain related. So that led uh, to um, thinking about what were the, some of the reasons for therapeutic failure and, and you have in your answers to the questions have clearly identified uh, each of these already and so I'm essentially going to use this as a way of summarizing uh, what you already uh, have told us. At the outset, I think that uh, both Frank uh, and your answers have uh, pointed to this question of our limited knowledge and perhaps our bias around um, whether pain exists in the absence of uh, self-report. Uh, this has led to uh, a number of attempts to address this question, both uh, from the uh, I asked a definition of pain in 2001 where the uh, word the inability to communicate in no way negates the possibility that an individual is experiencing pain and is in need of appropriate pain relieving treatment. Absolutely important um, uh, addition to the already accepted uh, definition of pain which is an unpleasant sensory, sensory emotional experience associated with actual potential damage or described in terms of such damage, which places very heavy emphasis on the capacity to communicate. On the basis of that, though, my uh, our colleague uh, Ken Craig has observed that um, that even in 2000, the definition from 2001 acknowledges the need of an individual with a disability and the importance of communication limitations. So, uh, but he also points out that it still fails to recognize that people with impairments are still able to communicate very effectively via nonverbal verbal behavior. And so when one thinks about communication, one needs to think across the spectrum of um, idiosyncratic uh, um, individual-based uh, nonverbal behavior as well as uh, the words that, that we might understand as being pain-specific. The second uh, issue that I think you all uh, reported in your answers and uh, is clear also from Frank's uh, presentation is that we have at the end limited access to that pain experience. While it's while we may understand the uh, neural system and how it might contribute to an altered pain experience at a biologic level, we might not have the capacity to truly understand what nonverbal communication means for that individual child. And so we can, uh, we sometimes are left with uh, a confusing picture of uh, conflicting signals. What is pain? What is non-pain? Uh, and that brings us to the importance of, of the assessment, even in the presence of uh, a difficulty of distinguishing the signal from the noise. I will say, though, at the at, as much as we might try to differentiate the signal from the noise, we um, have to make a guess because at the end of the day we have to make an assessment that uh, helps promote um, uh, reduced pain and, and uh, increased function. Uh, and so uh, at the core of the limited access is uh, frequently enormous uncertainty uh, about the um, uh, validity of the signal, but we should not use the absence of that certainty to prevent us from moving forward. We have to find some way of, of coping with that. What, is, uh, what does assessment offer us? Well, uh, Frank has, has mentioned a number of assessment scales and um, uh, clearly uh, self-report is a um, uh, well-recognized uh, approach to uh, assessing pain uh, across a lifespan. Uh, uh, perhaps not in uh, pre-verbal infants, but certainly in, in childhood and adults. This is often not available to us, and uh, while there has been um, work done by uh, Lynn Bro and others to um, 
identify the usefulness of self-report, it often rests on um, cognitive capacity, uh, the ability to uh, order uh, and rate uh, size and dimension, uh, especially if we're using a uh, scale that requires the individual to, uh, to tell us uh, how big or small that their pain is. However, uh, where uh, self-report is available, it, it does offer us uh, a window into the, um, the pain experience and uh, uh, should be used. Uh, observer report uh, has, over the last uh, 10 years, become an um, increasingly used uh, approach to uh, uh, assessing pain and treatment efficacy in uh, children with uh, developmental disabilities. There, uh, I'm going to uh, talk uh, briefly about uh, two measures uh, in a moment, uh, the uh, NICPIC and the triple P, although there are now uh, many other measures, and uh, Frank has mentioned the FLAC, uh, that also offers us uh, um, an opportunity to, uh, to measure uh, behavioral uh, and uh, physical changes over time. Biomarkers and biobehavioral measures uh, hold great promise as they are seen as uh, objective uh, or biologically based measures that might um, tell us something about how a, the NOSA system system, uh, system behaves or, or uh, responds. Uh, however, um, specific biomarkers such as uh, uh, beta endorphin and inflammatory markers uh, are still some years away from uh, uh, from being clinically useful tools. The combination of biobehavioral measures, again, also holds a great promise, but uh, in this setting um, uh, may be uh, somewhat limited because of the great variety of both physical uh, and motor uh, impairments um, that uh, would be uh, not present in, in, um, in other pediatric populations. Uh, and so, for the most part, uh, observer uh, rating scales are uh, now seen as the um, um, as the approach, approach approach of choice, the non-communicating uh, pain checklist. I'm going to refer to here. Uh, I'm going to refer to two measures. As I said, the non-communicating checklist. Uh, the work by uh, Pat McGraw and uh, Lynn Bro over the last almost 15 years um, established uh, this uh, uh, checklist as a way to um, identify uh, what the parents had. Uh, we're observing, um, and uh, it has been um, uh, uh, it's been shown that to demonstrate good psychometric properties, including reliability and validity in detecting a child in their uh, everyday setting. Uh, two other versions have uh, also been published: uh, a post-operative version and a revised version, which has retested um, the original Nick pick in a larger sample. Uh, and uh, the psychometric properties, um, and, and to evaluate its psychometric properties. Um, it has been successfully used in multiple populations um, uh, and, and uh, age groups as, as well. Um, the, uh, both in the uh, uh, acute post-operative setting and uh, an everyday setting. Uh, another measure that uh, may hold uh, some promise uh, as well is the uh, triple P uh, developed by Ann Hunter group in England. This is a behavioral rating scale for assessing pain in children with um, both physical and uh, learning uh, cognitive impairments. The, I think the interesting thing about this measure is that it's uh, semi-individualized uh, in that it gives the caregiver and parent uh, derived categories, but they are able to um, uh, they're able to uh, provide some uh, input that is specific uh, to the child. Um, uh, and what it does, it develops a set of individual symptom clusters around that, that particular uh, individual. Um, it has um, both a base and a ceiling for behaviors um, as the score goes from zero to three. Now, this may um, in some way artificially limit uh, the um, or constrain uh, assessment, but it does give uh, some uh, some measure of um, that is highly individualized to the child. It's sensitive, highly sensitive. It's reliable, but may not be generalizable beyond the individual child. As the NICPIC uh, provides a, um, a 
uh, more generalizable measure that can be compared across populations. The third uh, uh, reason that sometimes we're stumped is that we are uncertain about what the diagnosis is. And sometimes the pain symptom itself uh, can be regarded as the diagnosis. And so we, we tend to search or we, we tend to search for um, it as the leading edge for another diagnosis. And it, at a certain point, it raises the question about whether a diagnosis is necessary or even possible to make, uh, especially when we can't do a, you know, a serum pain level or uh, we can't image uh, uh, the source of the pain as we could if we were looking for a broken bone. And that often raises a question about uh, when to stop the unending search um, or what seems like the unending search. And in that situation, we uh, often find ourselves having to consider uh, multiple competing sources or etiologies for the pain. Um, and uh, while we, we would often like to make uh, pain a diagnosis of inclusion, or at least the source of the pain a diagnosis of inclusion, we're often having to say, well, we've excluded X, Y, and Z, and therefore uh, we, can, we, we must just uh, uh, deal with the symptom. Um, in a complex setting like this, there uh, is a need to resist the search for one unifying diagnosis. And in that sense, we have to consider multiple competing uh, etiologies. There also is a, a sense that uh, all irritability and suffering uh, is from the phenomena that we understand as pain, and therefore uh, other possibilities exist, like in the case of Joe, where we had to consider the possibility of poor mental health, uh, and while we didn't have access to his thoughts nor his mood in the same way we would have another child, um, we would probably be uh, uh, remiss if we, we ascribed all of his suffering to, uh, to his uh, musculoskeletal pain. Finally, uh, consideration of uh, occult sources of pain is, are, is critical, uh, and um, they have been tabulated in, in this uh, slide here as a way of, of uh, reminding us that um, uh, not all sources of irritability would be the same across uh, both typical and uh, uh, children with, um, with a, a developmental uh, disability. While seizures um, may in themselves not be uh, painful for some children, they may uh, uh, increase uh, spasticity and thereby uh, become painful for others. Similarly, migraines, which uh, we require uh, a high degree of self-report, um, both for the aura and for the, the actual location of the pain, uh, may not we not be able to identify that, and so we need to remember that as an occult source. I'm not going to go through all the list here, but um, I wanted just to highlight a number that um, could uh, qualify for occult uh, sources of irritability of unknown origin. One would be a corneal abrasion, uh, uh, lying in bed, uh, being moved, uh, may um, introduce uh, 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 ocular injury. Uh, similarly, um, uh, strangulation of, um, of a digit uh, with hair, uh, which may, may occur in young children, is also part is also present in children who are um, confined to uh, either a wheelchair or, or bed. And maybe, and, and there are probably many other sources of occult uh, pain, and I'd like to hear actually from the group about what other sources they found. The fourth uh, reason uh, that uh, therapy may fail is that we have uh, chosen the right drug, but in a poly drug setting, and we, this is where we often find ourselves, uh, children who have multiple, uh, multiple treatments, um, can have uh, drug failure from a number of different drug-related sources, including the pharmacodynamics, which is the response to the drug itself, pharmacokinetics, the way in which the drug um, is metabolized or is deposed throughout the body, pharmaceutics itself, the physical uh, nature of the drug, and how that might um, not be compatible with uh, administration through a G-tube or a J-tube, um, pharmacogenetics, routes of administration, uh, and adverse drug reactions um, that are idiosyncratic to the, that individual child. For the sake of uh, 
uh, today I'm going to highlight uh, three areas that I think are worth considering when we try to sort out uh, why uh, we have the right drug but the wrong response. The first is uh, to remind us that uh, drugs are uh, broken down, metabolized to a variety of different parts of the, uh, the body, um, and uh, the liver and kidneys uh, clearly play an important role. Uh, the part of the liver that I'd like to highlight is the uh, oxidation uh, metabolic pathway that uh, is encompassed by the cytochrome P450 system. Uh, I'll come back to that in a moment. Let me first start with the question of pharmacodynamics. This is, uh, by definition, a relationship between drug concentration and pharmacological effect and response. It's dependent on, on um, the receptors where the drugs uh, interact with, the activity of those receptors, the location of the receptors, the capacity to uh, uh, be transported across the blood-brain barrier. Illness severity might influence uh, the permeability of the blood-brain barrier and prior uh, exposure to the drug itself, which may lead to uh, tolerance. An example of this would be an example of pharmacodynamic reason for drug failure here would be opioid toxicity with a non-steroidal agent in the presence of uh, renal impairment. So there you would have uh, increased levels of uh, opioid toxicity um, associated with uh, non-steroidal induced um, renal impairment. Pharmacokinetics is the, uh, a second area I want to highlight. This is the uh, quantification of the time course, the rate of change and concentration of the drug, and or its metabolites in the body. And it involves uh, four critical parts, absorption of the drug, distribution of the drug, metabolism, and excretion. For the sake of this morning, I'm just going to focus on uh, metabolism, uh, which is illustrated in uh, the lower uh, right-hand uh, part of your screen. For the sake of completeness, I've also included a uh, description of distribution, absorption, and elimination. So metabolism is the biotransformation. It's irreversible loss of the biochemical uh, capacity due to conversion. And for the sake of this morning, I'm just going to focus on conversion in the liver. I'd like to just highlight uh, this uh, part, and I don't know if I've got a, if I have a, no, oh, I do. Uh, I'd like to highlight the uh, transformation of the drug to metabolite, first uh, metabolite through a phase one conversion involving the P450 system. Equally critical is phase two uh, metabolism, metabolism, but for the sake of, of time, I'm just going to focus on the contribution of the P450 system. Uh, this is 20 families or so of related uh, isozymes. Each enzyme contributes to the biotransformation, and as you can see, its nomenclature refers to both the family, the subfamily, and the isozyme itself. Uh, approximately 35 to 40 percent of all drugs are metabolized uh, by uh, 3A4 or 3A, uh, 3A5, uh, as illustrated in the lower right uh, pie diagram here. But equally important are 2D6 and uh, 2C9 and 2C19. Because uh, so many drugs are dependent on 3A4, this increases the potential for drug-drug interactions uh, by a, a induction or inhibition. Namely, only one drug at a time can serve as a substrate for a given enzyme. The interesting thing about the P450 system is that it has uh, three really interesting characteristics. One of them is that it is it the system itself can be induced. So both drugs and environmental factors can upregulate uh, uh, the capacity to metabolize uh, drugs. Uh, this results in upregulation of a gene that is, that is specific for that P450 enzyme. Uh, this really results in an increased drug uh, metabolism, metabolism and uh, elimination. Uh, drugs, smoke, and barbecued food can uh, induce the P450 system. The interesting thing about this is that it, it is uh, reversible. But not all P450s are inducible. The major ones that are not inducible are 3, 4, 2C9, and 2C19, which makes it a little bit more, uh, more interesting. The second characteristic that I want to highlight is inhibition. This results in a decreased activity of the cytochrome system uh, it uh, decreases elimination, uh, and it may occur with both long and short-term exposure to a drug. So, for, for example, 
selenidine, cyclosporin, rapamycin, fluoxetine, and um, and importantly, grapefruit juice um, can lead to inhibition of a P450 dependent process. Enzyme inhibition is reversible upon withdrawal of the agent, so that's reassuring. The third characteristic I want to highlight is one of saturation. So uh, some of the enzymes are present only in limited amounts, and if the drug concentration exceeds the metabolic capacity available, then saturation occurs. This may result in toxicity due to increased levels of that circulating unmetabolized drug. So let's go, let's take a look at how some of those factors might influence uh, both the presence of drug failure or uh, increase in side effects. So no benefit and only side effects. So if we look at um, three common uh, medications, and they happen to be medications that were being used in our in our uh, clinical vignette, um, we can see that uh, bedazolam or benzodiazepine depended on 3A4. And uh, in the presence of erythromycin, um, it would be, its metabolism would be inhibited, thereby leading to perhaps uh, toxicity. Uh, meparidine is dependent on 2D6. Um, but in the presence of, of peroxetine, uh, its uh, level may be uh, increased. And similarly, phenytoin, uh, in the presence of meprazole, uh, its metabolism may also be decreased. And so if we were to sort of uh, schematically represent what a drug interaction would look like, we could see that mental health, seizures, infection, and gastrointestinal tract treatment would all be uh, impacted by uh, the presence of, uh, of drugs that are either inhibitors or competitive or competitors for uh, the same enzyme. Just I'm just going to highlight one example here. In the case of the paradine, we might see uh, a serotonin syndrome, which would be an uh, increase in levels of, of serotonin. Because SSRIs inhibit 2D6, like peroxetine, as we saw in the last slide, uh, the presence of Haldol and an antidepressant like peroxetine would result in um, in therapeutic failure, so the SSRI might not be in um, might not be metabolized, uh, leading to uh, leading to toxicity. Um, similarly, erythromycin inhibits 3A4. Uh, this would decrease metabolism of uh, sorry metabolism of midazolam and fentanyl clearance, leading to uh, uh, increased side effects. Equally important to understanding how uh, drugs are cleared is to recognize the influence of genetic variations. This might not be available to us as a clinical tool, but one needs to think about this, especially when we're faced with uh, significant adverse drug reactions or the failure of a known drug at a reasonable dose to have a clinical effect. Pharmacogenetics is a difference in drug metabolism due to genetic factors. Single nucleotide polymorphisms, variations in uh, they, they can lead to variations in drug metabolism that range from 10 to 100 fold uh, between poor and extensive metabolizers. Illustrated in the next three bullets, slow metabolizers, uh, of course, lead to dysfunctional or inactive enzymes, uh, in contrast with ultra rapid metabolizers, leading to increased levels of enzymes uh, uh, and increased enzymatic activity, and presumably significantly lower levels of uh, apparent. Uh, drug or metabolites. Uh, variability in analgesic response varies, of course, across uh, populations around the world. Um, and uh, probably one of the most celebrated or recognized uh, examples comes from uh, the uh, uh, work by uh, Gideon Corn and others who have exa examined the uh, impact of the lack of uh, 2D6, uh, which actually uh, has been shown to lead to a uh, uh, the, a gene duplication has led to a rapid, uh, ultra-rapid me metabolic capacity, leading to uh, increase and in, uh, toxic levels of morphine, which is a metabolite of, of codeine, just as an example of how, how uh, analgesic response may uh, differ uh, with genetic um, uh, variations. It's important to remember that these genetic variations occur at a frequency much greater than what we think are uh, typically uh, present for uh, genetic uh, disorders such as Huntington's chorea, hemophilia, or cystic fibrosis, which occur at approximately less than 1% than of the population. 
And so these are these are not uh, inconsequential genetic variations uh, and need to be kept in mind when we think about um, uh, why some drugs work and some don't. So going back to uh, Joe and his pharmacologic cocktail, we can see that uh, his drug combination uh, in the presence of all those other problems led to a decrease in effectiveness of the drug and an increase in toxicity and health risk. He had uh, recurring GI reflux pain. And uh, as we worked through the problem, we began to realize that uh, putting um, miprazole through his G uh, tube uh, led to a decrease in its uh, pharmaceutical uh, property. We also were aware that the use of ibuprofen uh, may have led to increased airway reactivity and uh, increases risk for asthma. While we weren't able to genotype him and look as specifically at his um, uh, at his 2D6 um, allelic variations, we did consider that his poor response to opioids like codeine may have um, may reflect uh, the fact that he was a poor metabolizer or at least we, we asked the question. Uh, we also were concerned about uh, his behavior as a reflection of a possible serotonin syndrome, uh, which would have re reflected a combination of uh, use of paroxetine and, and the, the paradine, both competing for, uh, for 2D6. Well, it turns out that as we worked through this, uh, we began to sort out um, his GR condition. We stopped his ranitidine. Sorry, we added ranitidine. We stopped his NSAID. We replaced his codeine and we started a different end convulsant uh, that would avoid uh, the uh, 3A4 uh, metabolic pathway. However, his pain and irritability still persisted. And so we began to think about uh, the context in which he, um, uh, in which he uh, um, existed. And, uh, and I think you have, in your answers, have uh, highlighted uh, many of the, uh, the critical um, uh, answers to this question, why does it fail when um, and we need to look at the, uh, the, the context in which he, he existed. And at that point, uh, I'm going to uh, I'll leave this, uh, uh, I'll leave the, uh, the rest for discussion. Thank you, Doug. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Overlander. That was uh, that was great. It was a lot of uh, information. And I think you're absolutely right when you say the, the audience and their answers certainly uh, uh, sort of addressed a lot of, or are, are certainly aware of a lot of the issues that you're talking about uh, here and some of the challenges. Um, so with, with, with those two presentations b behind us now, uh, we'll, we'll open it up to some questions. If anyone has any questions for our presenters, I know we are a bit uh, behind schedule here, but we should have time for a couple of questions. Um, so uh, type your questions into the uh, question box if you do have them, and we'll, uh, we'll try, and, uh, try and get some answers for you. So uh, the one question that has come in, uh, is uh, what happened to Joe? Did you have input from other allied healthcare team members? Yes. Um, one of the critical uh, first steps was to uh, work on communication, not just uh, his communication with us, but uh, communication among team members uh, spread across uh, the region. And um, once we got uh, everybody in the room, both the virtual and real room, um, then we began to, to figure out uh, what our next steps were. So communication is really critical to uh, getting started. Uh, and the next question that came in is, uh, and, and uh, Frank, or uh, feel free to jump in as well. Uh, have you had any experience with sensory integration techniques such as uh, integrated learning system pillow? I, I have not. No, I have not either. But I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, besides the FLAC, uh, the FLACC, what are the validated clinical tools to measure pain? Well, I think that the uh, non-communicating checklist is, uh, is widely used um, and accepted by certainly um, nurses here and in, and in the community. Um, the FLAC uh, may be useful um, in a post-operative setting, uh, but it also, because it relies on uh, assessing limb movement, uh, it may not be available or useful for some individuals who, where, where limb movement is, is impaired. Uh, I don't know, Frank, what do you think? Uh, well, no, I mean, I think, um, I, I think there's a few scales out there. I mean, FLAC and sure, Nick Vicar and a, a couple others. I think, um, I think it's sort of different sometimes between measurement and assessment and bedside feasibility. I think it turns on those things. So, um, certainly some nursing groups, if that's bedside in part, besides from physicians, 
uh, you know, time is limited, and so you might see the flat. In other contexts, uh, you might see the nick pick. I've also seen uh, pediatric pain profile. So partly it depends on local buy-in, and I think I've heard Tim and his colleague Hal Seiden mention or discuss this sort of, sort of, it may be less important of what's the, you know, there's no absolute right scale, but use something uh, so that you can document, and then it's going to be goal-driven. What's the purpose in terms of kind of triage versus outcome? Uh, are you dealing in a setting with chronic versus acute, etc.? So there's tools. It just depends on what the goal is and how you're going to use it. I, I would just add that the um, at the end of the day, the most important thing is that it's a tool for communication. It's a tool for getting on the same page, and it allows you to measure something over time. And in that sense, um, uh, as a metric, all of those measures uh, are equally useful. Uh, the next question that came in was uh, uh, is asking, are you aware of work that has been done with children with uh, that have been diagnosed with Down syndrome and pain management? Uh, she's uh, identifying that in the intensive care environment post-operatively, uh, in, her, in her experience, these children ha seem to have a limited response to opioids and benzodiazepines. Yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of, of somebody reporting um, pharmacological reasons why that would be the case, but that's... Um, that's a great question, and uh, I need to go and do, go away and and, uh, and find out if there is a, a reported reason for that. Yeah, Janine is saying that this was a wonderful presentation. I, I agree, and thank you very much for that. Uh, she's asking, uh, she's wondering if there are any key communities of practices, key communities of practice or websites that you can re recommend that would help to further uh, their knowledge in the area of pediatric pain management, particularly for kids with uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, that's a great question. You know, off the top of my head, I don't know. You know, every two years on the east coast of Canada through the Halifax or Dalhousie group, they convene at the International Forum on Pediatric Pain and with Christine Chambers and Pat McGraw and Alan Finley and that group. And I know they have a website for their group and their lab. Um, and I am blocking on the name of their website, so forgive me if you're among us. Um, but that that may be a starting point. I don't know if sort of, of a clearinghouse like uh, a site that I, I, I don't know, nothing comes to mind. I do know, I mean, we're trying to, we by we, I mean, there's a, a, a couple of us here at Gillette and um, in um, Europe, you know, within IASP, International Association of the Study of Pain, we want to form a special interest group, a SIG, specific to pain and developmental disability. That's wishes we haven't done that so i don't i don't have a concrete answer that was an academic answer in terms of someone talking a lot but i didn't answer the question <laughs> yeah i would agree with frank i, I think also the pediatric uh uh pain oh, thanks, uh, listserv is also a very valuable resource where uh, questions generate uh, very good discussion yeah. No, I would. I just put up the uh, uh, the, and you're absolutely right uh, when you comment on our co our colleagues out in Halifax at Dalhousie University. They do have a huge uh, uh, a number of researchers that are all interested in children's pain, and they I put up the Center for Pediatric Pain Research website, which is located in Halifax. Um, they have a lot of great resources, and in fact, they just po uh, posted a guest post on CAFSI's blog. Uh, if you go to our website, CAFSI.org, you can see a post from Christine Chambers, who uh, you may remember from one of our previous uh, uh, webinars on children's pain, and one, uh, one of the many members from the CIHR team in children's pain that has come and presented with us. Um, they also have a Facebook page, uh, if uh, that's more uh, your style, as far as engaging with the community that is interested in children's pain. Again, not focused specifically on uh, on pain in children with disabilities, but uh, I'm sure there, there are lots of people in that community that are, are interested in that specific area. Thanks, Doug. Yeah. Uh, the next question uh, is asking, could the significance of a difference in temperature of the right versus left leg be reviewed a little more? Uh, she says her, this is from a family member, she's saying her child has this and no providers have answers for this phenomenon. So she's just wondering if you can go just a little more information about that? Yeah. So. Let me preface it with what I said earlier. You know, I'm the I'm an academic, and so I have no business talking about practice in any meaningful way in the same way Tim does. Here's what I know, um, and I'll, I'll contextualize it specific to girls with RET. Um, that is diagnostic for the condition. Um, one of the markers, the aphid temperature asymmetry related to autonomic regulatory. So 
the degree to which that temperature is different, there are vascular regulatory problems. I have been interested in it from a pain perspective, from a very simple perspective of living 5, 10, 15 years with these dramatic differences, particularly the affected limb, and wondering if there aren't downstream initially neurobiological consequences related to the way the different classes of sensory nerve fibers work and the kind of information that's either getting in or not getting in to spinal cord and up the brain is likely altered and whether that's and just quite candidly openly whether that's not something to be concerned about in terms of potentially being a pain driver now just the images themselves don't tell you that but they do tell you about the presence of that asymmetry and how uh, large or small it is. It's certainly not. And the thermography world went down that path 20 some years ago and at great expense to the professional reputation in terms of images and things like diagnostics for all sorts of things, breast cancer, etc. I'm not advocating it from a diagnostic perspective. I'm definitely coming at it from a clinical research perspective. But it makes me wonder if there's a you know at an individual child level living with um that severe of a difference um if that can't contribute and that what i put up as that pilot data is just one example of hey you know the girls for whom we saw more pain expressivity on exam were also the girls who had pretty significant asymmetries i can't say whether one is causing the other but i think they go together now, but I said also, we haven't replicated that. We don't always see that pattern. So to come back to what's the significance of it, I'm not entirely sure, but I think at least in a RET context, it's part of their phenotype and it has not been investigated. And so I'm interested in it as a marker for potential problems related to pain or autonomic regulation. And when therapeutic trials come about for RET, it may be a, a, a potential non-invasive marker for therapeutic change. So that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, I don't know if that's helpful or not, but those are my thoughts. Uh, the next question is, uh, and I'm trying to go through the questions a little bit more quickly than usual here because we do have quite a few. Um, the next question is asking, what about ongoing communication between family caregivers and the treatment team? Uh, she's saying, are there new models of work seamlessly between formal and informal supports and reporting that you and and reporting that you are aware of she uses the ties support networks to coordinate complex community care but she knows that that's not widely used so I'm not sure if you're familiar with that uh, with the ties support network or if you have any any other suggestions about that coordination and communication uh, no I, I, I'd like to learn more about that because that's um, a really critical uh, part of uh, part of uh, managing um, unmanageable symptoms um, and maybe offline I can uh, I can hear more about that it, 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 communication obviously varies and, and how you put a team together varies from community to community because the uh, resources uh, uh, are often uh, limited to um, large urban areas certainly in British Columbia uh, we've got a large geography and uh, a disparate population. Um, the internet is, is uh, an effective tool, uh, teleconferencing, and um, uh, but in the end, uh, sometimes uh, on-site visit is absolutely necessary, um, where you know, usual types of communication don't uh, don't suffice. But I'd, I'd like, yeah, I'd like to hear more about the the, yeah, and it, the, the models that are out there. Yeah, and she the the ties support networks. The ties is spelled T Y Z E. Um, just in, for anyone who's who's looking that up. But uh, uh, the next question is uh, saying that she has been in, uh, this person has been impressed with uh, the effectiveness of non pharmacologic interventions, uh, especially music therapy and stimulation of vestibular systems, swings, vibration, etc. Um, and she says she suggests it's always good to involve. Uh, OT and play therapists, music therapists, etc., with, with this population. Any comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, I, for the sake of time, I didn't get to that uh, the non-pharmacologic part of my uh, my slides. Uh, but uh, absolutely, and uh, occupational and physical therapy is uh, an essential part of, uh, of the treatment. Uh, just as uh, um, 
psychological or um, child life uh, therapy using uh, distraction, um, even guided imagery is available to some children. And that, that's critical, uh, good question, and it's an important addition to the uh, mm. conversation. All right. Um, we'll take, uh, I think we've got time for two more questions here. The first one should be short. Um, I can't remember which of you mentioned it, but uh, one of you mentioned the pain examination procedure and the pain and discomfort scale. And she's just asking where she would find more information on that. Yeah, I mentioned that. Um, if you just email me, I can send you that um, information. What we did, that was work with a colleague named Jim Bodfish from the, um, that Millcroft uh, May Day supported meeting. And we adapted the non-communicating children pain checklist somewhat um, in terms of the way the items were scored a little bit and paired it with a pain examination procedure that's just a standardized sort of passive range of motion. But I have all that material and information. Happy to share it. And you can fi find Dr. Simon's information uh, on the, the page on the Knowledge Exchange Network here where it where the link for his uh, – this, this link here takes you to his page on the University of Minnesota site and his email address and phone number are there if, if you would like to contact him. Uh, yeah, and, the, the, yeah, and the last question that we'll take is uh, uh, someone asking, have you had the opportunity to explore the role that sleep, depri that sleep deprivation plays in the pain experience for these children? Certainly, clinically, uh, it's a question that we, we always ask uh, in terms of systematically uh, studying this. This is an area of, of great interest to a colleague of mine, Dr. Chris Rugula, Rugula here in, um, uh, at Sunny Hill. Um, and uh, it's an area that, uh, that needs desperate um, uh, work uh, because uh, uh, sleep uh, disturbances are critical component of uh, irritability and um, whether they're connected causally or whether they just exist in the, the same time is unclear and that needs to be, uh, needs to be studied. Good question, important question. All right. Well, thank you for that. And that uh, will give me a little, let me give a little bit of a teaser out there and that uh, we are going to be having a series, a uh, webinar series. It's not on the calendar yet coming up in the spring, probably March, April. Uh, from another of our CIHR t uh, team colleagues, uh, a team in uh, is looking at sleep uh, in children and uh, pain and sleep is, I believe, one of the topics we're going to have. So stay tuned uh, for a few more months, and I think we'll maybe have some more, some lots more information on that on sleep and children uh, with pain, uh, a problem with pain coming up in a, in a few months. So with that, I think we're going to wrap it up. We have gone a little bit over time, but as you can tell, I mean, the, the interest, the audience is still out there. I can tell that uh, most of them are still there and the number of questions that are uh, coming in, uh, you know, you can tell the interest is, is clearly there in this topic. And there are lots of our colleagues out there that are, are struggling to help these, uh, these children with disabilities that are experiencing pain. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll just hand it over to you, to you both uh, quickly if you want to have uh, your final comments before we sign off. Right. I will, I will, I will give a... I will give Tim the final word. Thank, I appreciate everybody's time and attention. And if there's any interest uh, in any of the part I had, just email me. Happy to talk um, informally or formally about the work we're doing um, or and how it relates to self-injury, if that's of interest. So uh, go ahead, Tim. Yeah, I, I'd also like to just thank uh, Kafsi and, and Doug and Frank for a chance to uh, participate in this conversation. And I also welcome uh, comments and, and uh, happy to continue the discussion offline. Thanks very much. All right. Well, thank you both. Uh, and thank you to uh, Jennifer Peleshek and Sarah Promislow from the, the CIHR team in Children's Pain and from the Center for Pain uh, Studies at uh, the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto, who uh, sort of pull all the other pieces of this uh, event together for us with our pain webinars. Uh, and uh, as always, we do these webinars uh, on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. We do record them. We had a couple questions about uh, will people be able to access this afterwards. Absolutely. The, pain, the page that's on the screen right now is the page that you will be able to access it in a couple of days. You will receive an email with that link uh, in a couple of days. And the PowerPoint presentations, if we're able to share them, I did see some pictures, so I'm not sure if we have permission to share those pictures beyond this, but I'll certainly communicate with our two presenters uh, following this. So thanks to everyone uh, who uh, joined us today. Today and hopefully we will see you uh, on our next webinar. Bye, everyone.